When I was three, I loved cars. So did my parents. We lived in the hills of Scotland, and without a car, we were stranded. However, when I moved to Edinburgh, everything changed. I got a brand new bicycle, and I spent each evening exploring the city, cycling until I got lost. One day, my dad drove us into the middle of town, and we searched and searched for a parking space. After an hour, we gave up, drove home, and walked instead. <laughs> my dad, he never drove again. He sold his car, and we became a family of cyclists. 1978 was the year I fell out of love with the car. In the countryside, the car was often essential, but in the city, the car seemed like a pointless luxury. Yet, fast forward 40 years. And the culture of car ownership remains hugely dominant and defines the way our cities look today. And it's not just the cars; it's the multi-story car parks, it's the four-lane highways, it's the traffic lights, it's the barriers, it's the miles of endless tarmac. We have been sold the car as an engineering solution, but it's not. The car is a question of culture. The car is a mobile sculpture, something to set off our homes, something to bring to special occasions, something that indicates taste, success, and our place in society. The culture of private car ownership seems so at odds with environmental concerns. But people are buying ever larger four-wheel drive vehicles, often steroid-injected versions of the VW Beetle or this Fiat Cinquecento. So let's look at some car mythologies. Mythology one: the car is fast. When I moved to London in the 90s, I was astonished with how slowly the traffic snaked through the city. The average speed of a car in London is less than eight miles an hour. <laughs> That's half my cycling speed. I also had an inkling that walking was often faster than descending into the bowels of the London tube system. I felt that if travellers were able to compare modes of transport, time-wise. Then they might choose to walk or cycle. I wanted to dispel the illusion that the car was fast, even if it looks fast, or that the tube was easy to navigate. So I mapped out central London. I filmed my journeys, taking every mode of transport, and then I took the time code from those films, and I created a series of prints based on temporal rather than geographical space. My tube map revealed that we often spend more time underground, going to and from platforms, than on the tube itself. People coming to my exhibition, after studying my prints, would go home very often another way from the way that they had come. <laughs> well, of course, now we all have GPS on our mobile phones, so we all think in temporal space. But do you notice how Google puts the car as first choice, with the bicycle only as a last resort? This bias towards the car is designed. It's not a question of engineering; it's a question of culture. Mythology two: cars are a sound investment. Many cars lose 70 percent of their value within the first five years of being purchased. Now this is bad news for car owners, but it's good news for artists like myself. For little more than thirty pounds, I can buy quite a nice-looking vehicle, chop it in half vertically, and stick it on a Victorian swing bridge. Or I can slice them in half horizontally for installations such as Come Hell or High Water, which I created at a time when streets were flooding throughout the UK. And a half-submerged car became the symbol to represent extreme weather caused by climate change. Mythology three: cars are safe. 
Injuries from road accidents are the leading cause of death for people aged between 15 and 29. For years, we've designed roads to allow the car to move ever faster through our towns and cities, with the basic premise that if we keep people away from the roads, then everyone will be safer. However, quite the opposite is true. I was lucky enough to work on Europe's largest shared space scheme. This scheme transformed a four-lane ring road in Ashford into a street where there was no distinction between pedestrians and cars. To manage this process required an enormous shift in public perception. And this is where the use of art proved to be invaluable. I programmed a series of artworks which used the streets of Ashford, such as this mile-long flock of birds, painted by the artist Rodesworth, and seen here as the Tour de France raced madly through the town. Meanwhile, Brad Downey adapted a pelican crossing, which required you to climb on someone's shoulders to push a button. <laughs> Brian e. Graham tarmacked all our clothes. And I built a monument to the Lost Ring Road with all the signs which were no longer necessary. This proved to be controversial, with the Daily Mail claiming, falsely, that my sculpture had caused dozens of accidents. <laughs> True, they were some teething problems, but the scheme did result in a 63% drop in accidents. Mythology 4. Cars are clean. For several years, I've created projects that have focused on climate change, such as Plunge, where I marked the future sea level on major monuments throughout London, and Low Key Door, where I pulled out jettisoned objects from the Parisian canals to highlight the never-ending cycle of consumption and waste. A group of environmental psychologists from Norway analysed this work and then approached me to see if they could commission a work which they could study in more depth to see whether art can really change people's perceptions of climate change. Well, I was intrigued by this invitation, so I travelled up north to Trondheim and I spent days with the team discussing their findings. One thing that became crystal clear was that people don't change their behaviour unless an issue touches them directly. During our discussions, shocking images came through from New Delhi. On the day of their annual marathon, the air pollution index had peaked well above 1,000. Meanwhile, back in Norway, we were luxuriating in an air pollution index of less than eight. It made me think about my journey from London to Norway and how the first thing I noticed when leaving the plane was how incredibly pure the air was. I started to think about my life in London and how air pollution affects me as I cycle to school with my children, past the many, many parents who drive their kids to school. I thought about how the car so successfully isolates drivers and passengers from their surroundings, lowering their empathy for those outside the car's protective shell. So how could I raise a sense of empathy? For sure, when we read, we can intellectually understand why cars are so harmful to others in the city. When we see an image, we can emotionally start to comprehend the impact of air pollution. But I suspected that only through the embodiment of an experience could we truly start to empathise with others. So came the birth of the pollution pods. Five geodesic domes made from Norwegian spruce, each dome containing the polluted air from a city around the world. Easy. I thought I could just take an air compressor, bring it to the city of my choice, suck in the air, bring it back and let it slowly out. I assume there's some engineers in the audience. Thankfully, I talked to some scientists at the Norwegian Institute of Air Research and they stopped me dead in my tracks. They said such an approach could be potentially deadly. 
So we decided to collaborate, and we infused and distilled the causes of air pollution. And for our show in Norway, we used a dirty old generator and a bunch of old chemicals to make our cocktails. <laughs> well, to be honest, this was kind of exhausting and finally terrible for my health. So back in London, I shifted tack. And with the help of a leading fragrance house, IFF, we started to make bespoke scents. Each scent, each perfume cocktail being crafted by a perfumer who lived in the city being emulated. <laughs> Surprisingly, the pollution pods are popular. People actually want to visit these toxic environments. <laughs> New Delhi is by far the worst. Doctors have seen patients die of lung cancer in their 30s. Patients who have never smoked a cigarette in their life. The causes of air pollution in New Delhi are complex and include diesel emissions, domestic cooking, badly maintained roads, crop burning and poor waste management. However, for Western cities such as London, the problem is simple. Get rid of the combustion engine and you get rid of nearly all the air pollution. Air pollution in London, like many European cities, has been exacerbated by the shift from the petrol to the diesel engine. In the recent past, people have had large subsidies to allow them to buy diesel cars because diesel cars emit less carbon dioxide. But what we all now know is that governments were deceived by major car manufacturers such as Volkswagen, who built devices in their cars expressly to hide the most deadly pollutants while their cars were being tested. Recently, I was looking at the air pollution index in London, and I was astonished to see that on October the 20th, the API was only six. I mean, that is better than the Norwegian mountains. It then occurred to me that this was the day of the enormous anti-Brexit march and very little traffic could get into time. But what was even more remarkable was that this low level of air pollution continued well into the following week. The problem with the car is a cultural one. In fact, it's a monocultural one. For too many years, we've taken it as a given that the road should be designed and built for the car. Like a pernicious weed, the car's land grab has pushed all other transport options to the fringes. But we are now at a time when the diversity of independent transport could blossom. And that's not only with walking and the bicycle, but with the unicycle and the tricycle, the skateboard and the electric skateboard, the scooter and the electric scooter, the Segway, the wheelchair, the mobility scooter and the rickshaw. Take cars off our roads and these modes of transport could flourish. Imagine being able to roller skate to work safely. How much fun would that be? <laughs> so what can we do? Well, firstly, we can march for clean air. The protest itself reduces air pollution. <laughs> <laughs> We can walk with our children to school. That saves four car journeys a day. What many parents don't realize is that when they drive their children to school, they're not only polluting everyone around them, but they're actually poisoning their own child within their car. We can ask our schools for timed road closures for when we bring and take our children to school. This is starting to happen all over the UK. And if you live in the city and you have a car, please send it to me. I'd be delighted to make a sculpture with it. <laughs> or better still, you can make a sculpture with it for your parking space outside your home for friends and neighbours to admire. Thank you. <laughs>